Hello again everyone and welcome back to the Underground. This is the Intel update for Sunday the 10th of July 2022 and it is being recorded the day prior on the 9th of July. So let's get right to it. Up first as usual are infrastructure incidents and concerns and I'm going to kind of breeze through these a little quickly uh, because there haven't been too many uh, that are worth talking about in the infrastructure category this time around. Uh, but up first in the northeast in Connecticut, uh, there was a grocery store that uh, caught fire and burned down uh, in the early hours of the morning of July 4th. Really no information on this whatsoever, just wanted to point out that it did happen. Uh, it's kind of a smaller grocery store, it's not a national chain, and uh, grocery store fires are uh, unfortunately quite common, so I don't know if this one is uh, more nefarious or not, just wanted to kind of put it out there. Moving down to the southeast, uh, I'm sure there was something that happened of, of note, but I haven't quite found it yet. So uh, through my several hours worth of digging, I haven't really found anything worth talking about for the southeast. So we'll just go ahead and go to the east central Midwestern region, which, of course, again, not very much going on this time around. But there was a fire metal processing facility, I think. This one is very vague. Again, more some of the more industrial fires in uh, smaller townships don't really get a whole lot of press, uh, if they get any press at all. So uh, even the local news agency for this one in, out of uh, White House, Ohio, didn't know what in the Sam Hill was going on with this one. So it looks like it was just a, a small uh, fire at a metal processing facility. Uh, the cause is unknown, and of course the investigation is underway. So it is, this one looks like more more of your routine ones, but but you can't really tell, of course, because there's just no information on it. Again, keeping Michigan in our minds, we have the Abbott Laboratories uh, flood recovery. Uh, no news on that front, uh, so we're still waiting for an update from Abbott Laboratories. Moving to the West Central Midwestern region, same story, nothing really new to report. I'm sure something happened, but I haven't found it for this time around. So let's go down to the Southwest, in which case there was only one thing of note, and it was, of course, again, a liquid uh, natural gas pipeline fire. Uh, so this was out in Fort Bend County, Texas. Uh, there was a decently large, uh, as they always are, uh, pipeline burst uh, in the middle of uh, just a farmer's field. So I uh, don't know if somebody clipped it with you know some kind of agricultural implement, as is extremely common. Uh, because uh, for those of you who don't know, most pipelines are pretty, they're not very deep underground. They're only a few feet um, in most cases, sometimes less than that. Uh, so people hitting pipelines is not exactly an uncommon thing uh, to have happen in, in a lot of areas. But again, this one was in such a remote area and there wasn't any apparent construction going on in the immediate vicinity. So there's no real telling uh, what the cause of this was. But again, since it's a pipeline burst uh, explosion type thing, uh, we're probably not going to hear about what the cause of this was. And finally, for the West, again, nothing significant to report. So let's go ahead and move to the suspicious fires. Really only have two fires to add for uh, this briefing, and that is on July 1st in Patterson, New Jersey. The Greater Assembly House of Prayer uh, caught fire. Uh, this one have no information on it whatsoever. But moving on to number 10, we have uh, on the 8th of July in Waverly, Tennessee, a fire at the Glenwood Church of Christ. Uh, this one is, a we have a little bit more information on, but still very sketchy. Not a whole lot of information uh, gets put out there uh, with regards to church fires, um, specifically church fires. Uh, but the local authorities have been kind of hesitant to say that this is under investigation for arson, but the even just the local sheriff kind of commented that this is just one of seven or eight suspicious fires in the local area over the past few weeks. So it looks like there might be something going on there in Waverly, Tennessee, but again, we have seen this, this kind of behavior pop up in various places around the country, just these kind of uh, arson-style incidents, right? So again, we're really probably not going to hear a whole uh, lot about these suspicious fires that have been occurring around the country because we can call them suspicious, but you know, if a local jurisdiction calls them non-suspicious fires, then you know, where where are we gonna what are we gonna do? You know, there's if that's kind of where the investigation stops. You know, the investigation stops, right? So uh, we'll move on to the more unfortunate slides, which are the kinetic incident trackers. Now, I had to change this uh, quite significantly because I did not have nearly enough room to make these all on, uh, make these fit all on one slide. So. We're going to have to break these down again by region. So we'll start again with the Northeast region uh, and talk about some of the more kinetic incidents that have occurred over the past 90 days or so. Really, the two newest additions to this unfortunate uh, tracker come to us from Worcester, Massachusetts, 
uh, and they are two centers uh, that were uh, the target of Jane's Revenge uh, in, in roughly the same kind of area. And those were the Problem Pregnancy, uh, which is a, a clinic, and again, Clearway Clinic as well. So two pro-life clinics or resource centers, or however you wanted to word it, uh, were attacked again by Jane's Revenge, who claimed these attacks on their websites. Moving down southeast, we have quite a diverse uh, arrangement of terrorist attacks for this cycle, uh, beginning with the new additions uh, for this time, which are on the 3rd of July in Hillsboro, North Carolina. The Holy Family Catholic Church was vandalized. No agency has claimed this uh, particular attack, but it was most likely Antifa due to the graffiti they left behind. Uh, this is just, again, one of many different church vandalisms that has occurred over the past 90 days. The next day, on July 4th, also in North Carolina, in Asheville, North Carolina, there was an IED attack uh, on a local statue, or what the site of a former statue. So, again, this is not particularly surprising. Uh, Asheville, North Carolina has a pretty solid Antifa uh, sort of left-wing militant presence, uh, and it would make a lot of sense because uh, Asheville actually took down a lot of their uh, statues. Uh, remember when last year, or the year before last, where all of the, you know, Every government agency was looking to destroy any kind of history they possibly could of the Civil War or things like that. Asheville, North Carolina had a lot of statues that they tore down, and it looks like a couple of dudes affiliated with Antifa or some other leftist group uh, tried to build some homemade uh, pipe bombs to blow up basically the, the base of where a statue used to be. So there wasn't a statue there anymore. They, the, the government had already destroyed it or removed it. Uh, these guys were just trying to, do, to, to make, again, some kind of stupid attack on the site of where a statue used to be. But again, they were arrested, of course, and um, I guess we'll see how that goes. Probably will be bailed out almost immediately. Uh, but on, on the same day in Richmond, Virginia, there was a mass shooting that was actually thwarted by a local citizen. So this is a very interesting case that, of course, has been blacked out by the media because the two guys who were planning on conducting mass shootings against soft targets at July 4th celebrations, uh, these two guys were uh, illegal immigrants. So, of course, the mainstream media would not report on this kind of thing, but I thought this was a very interesting case because the attack was thwarted very interestingly. Of course, the Richmond, uh, Virginia police claimed 100% of the credit, uh, but it was actually stopped by a concerned citizen who reportedly overheard their plans to conduct a mass shooting. So I'm very interested to see what the details are because overhearing a terrorist attack being planned is that almost never happens. So was this were these guys literally like discussing their plans like in their house and their neighbor heard them or were they discussing it in a public location and someone overheard it? I'm not entirely sure, but uh, either way, uh, this concerned citizen reported uh, what they heard to the local authorities who then searched their place and got them to uh, confirm confess slash uh, found all of their uh, the weapons they were planning to use. Yeah, very interesting case of domestic terrorism uh, being thwarted on U.S. soil again by concerned citizens. So very interesting case indeed. And finally in Georgia, one of the more interesting cases that I'm sure has swept all the way through the bottom depths of the internet by now. Uh, this is the IED attack on the Georgia Guidestones. So this is a very, very, very interesting case, uh, depending on how far you want to go go down the rabbit hole of weird stuff on the internet. And so for those who don't understand why this is such a polarizing slash interesting event, uh, it really surrounds the Georgia Guidestones themselves, which are a very controversial monument that was put up a few years ago by unknown secretive groups slash agencies slash individuals, right? Uh, and this, you can go read the Wikipedia page before it gets deleted from the internet uh, about w what the Georgia Guidestones actually said, um, but it's, depending on how strange you want to get into it, what, what's undeniable, I should say, let me, let me just start there, what's undeniable is what the tablets have said. It's a stone series of stone monuments, kind of like an American version of Stonehenge, right? So are a stone monument outdoors in the middle of nowhere uh, that has some really weird inscriptions on it. Uh, basically, Ten Commandments, so to speak, for humanity, I guess. But the reason why this has been so controversial is what the commandments are. So what's undeniable is that these tablets uh, endorse things like mass genocide, uh, population control, uh, medical tyranny, eugenics, and things weird things like that, right? So, of course, it's going to get a lot of press when something like this gets blown up. 
a lot of people have in the past attributed this as like a a monument to uh, like either Satanism or just like a sign of the Antichrist or something like that, like a World Economic Forum thing. Uh, it's really hard to kind of put this into words, what this thing actually was. I think the most interesting part about all of it is not really the, the rabbit hole stuff that you can go down on the internet, but the, the fact that this was attacked uh, using uh, IEDs, right? In the past... The, the Georgia Guidestones, of course, based on the controversial things that these that's inscribed on these tablets, w these have been the subject of attack for a long time. They've been vandalized, graffiti has been, they've been sprayed up with graffiti a lot. Uh, this, is, th this is nothing new. What is new is someone using explosives to try to blow them up. So yeah, pretty interesting. Um, I think though what's more interesting is the fact that there was pretty good security at the Georgia Guidestones like perimeter. Uh, due to the past attacks that have kind of happened, uh, they put up a lot of security cameras and they've got a pretty good like, you know, security perimeter. I won't say it's great, but it looks to me like from what I've seen, uh, pretty decent. And especially for in the middle of nowhere, Georgia. And yet this kind of thing still happened. I think, though, what is the most interesting part about the entire thing is that this IED attack occurred in the early hours of the morning on July 6th. So way before, right in the middle of the night. Uh, on July 6th. Well, by the end of that day, after the detonation had occurred, they, the Guidestones were dismantled and destroyed. People noticed construction equipment out there tearing down the rest of the monuments. So, from what I know about investigations of IED attacks on U.S. soil, I'm very highly suspicious that the site of an IED attack, where you're trying to conduct chemical forensics and, and conduct an investigation, gets dismantled in just a few hours, right, after this IED attack happened. Like, you would think there'd be crime scene tape around this for at least a week or so while people are trying to figure out what happened and maybe go after the people because, you know, ID attacks are not, they're not common here in the United States, especially against, you know, like a hardened structure like a stone tablet, right? So I don't know. I, I think that the destruction of these guidestones immediately following uh, the, the explosive attack on them, I think that's sketchy, though I don't really know what else to think about it. But again, this is kind of a more weird one, but since we don't really get to talk about IED attacks too often, Often, uh, you know, except in the context of like Antifa or somebody, uh, I thought I'd mention it, and especially considering I know that people are going to have a lot of questions about it. So I guess we'll see what comes of it. But my guess is due to the highly suspicious and secretive nature of the t the, the guidestones themselves, uh, my guess is we're probably not going to hear much about this uh, anymore. So I don't know. We'll see though. Moving to the East Central Midwestern region, we really just have three additions for this time, three uh, different terror attacks. Uh, all three, of course, claimed by Jane's Revenge, uh, and all three are vandalism. So the first one was in Detroit, Michigan, where a pro-life center, a pregnancy center, again, was vandalized as expected and as you can see on the slide there numbers four and five occurred on the 22nd of june in jackson michigan both of them occurred they they shared an office so uh one of these uh places that was attacked was a uh, pro-life center the jackson right to life center uh and the other one was interestingly enough a congressman's office so republican congressman tim Wahlberg's office was vandalized along with the right to life center there it's a small building they kind of shared the same structure and people uh, graffitied it up pretty good and uh, damaged some of the facilities there. So so again, not really surprising. This is kind of the MO by now for a lot of these leftist groups. But again, just wanted to mention it because uh, we're seeing these attacks increase all over the nation. Moving to the West Central Midwestern region, we have two new additions for this time. Both of them vandalism, both of them claimed by Jane's Revenge. Again, pretty standard by now. Uh, one of them was a pro-life center in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, which was uh, the Birthright Center uh, company there, just, just kind of like a pro-life center. Uh, they were attacked on the 5th of July. And then going back to the 2nd of June, I forgot to mention this one on the last uh, last time. Uh, this was in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, a, an organization called DSM Street Medics, which is a, like a pro-life resource center. Uh, they were also vandalized and again claimed by Jane's Revenge. Moving to the southwestern region, we have a whole lot of nothing. Uh, I haven't been able to find any in the states of Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, or Oklahoma. 
Oklahoma, though I'm sure uh, different attacks have occurred. I just haven't found them yet. So a lot of these are very much buried by the media, and I'm sure that you can understand how hard it is to find these uh, digging through the depths of the internet these days. But uh, again, we'll keep an eye on the Southwest, but usually we're not really going to see too much uh, just because of the climate and the nature of these attacks, right? So, so for the Western region, we have two new additions uh, for this slide this time. Both of them occurred on the 27th of June. Uh, the first one was in Portland, Oregon. Uh, the Mother and Child Education Center, it was like a pregnancy center, uh, was vandalized again by Jane's Revenge. Now, I should note that this one is very interesting. Uh, the local locals seem to think that this might have been an accident uh, because because the Mother and Child Education Center is, uh, they have not picked a side on the Roe versus Wade thing. So they are not pro-choice and they are not pro-life, at least according to them. It's really hard to kind of say why they were targeted because they don't, I'm not entirely sure if they offer abortions at this facility. It seems like they're more along the lines of just, a, just an education center and they kind of appeal to everyone at this particular place. Uh, a lot of these pregnancy centers you're going to find are very much pro-life, uh, as you would expect, uh, but this one is more more center of the road, um, which uh, is a little confusing to me, but it is Portland, right? So it kind of makes sense. In any case, I looked at the photos of this uh, facility's uh, vandalism, and it seems like it it could very well be a case of mistaken identity because this the name of this place is Mother and Child Education Center, and if you look at the logo of the agency, it looks very much like a pro-life facility. So my guess is that the roaming bands of Antifa members who have basically nested in Portland over the past decade or so probably just saw the sign and said, you know what, we're going to we're gonna attack that place. So, so yeah, either way, this one looked like it was more of a, a, a target of opportunity rather than a deliberately planned, uh, coordinated attack. And on the same day, uh, the 27th of June in Longmont, Colorado, a facility called Life Choices, which is a more of a pro-life center, uh, education center type, type thing, uh, it was set on fire and that is currently being listed as arson. So so again, not a lot of this is surprising, unfortunately, but still got to keep a, keep an eye on this just so that everyone's aware of the, the levels of terrorism that are going on around this country. Before we moved on, I briefly wanted to mention that there has been some congressional interest in all of these attacks that seem to be popping up all over the country. Uh, for instance, Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa sent a letter to the FBI last week urging the FBI to investigate the more than 40 pregnancy centers that have been attacked since the Roe v. Wade leak. This is in addition to the letter Tom Cotton sent to the Department of Justice last month also urging the FBI to do their job. The FBI has responded by saying that they are instigating, excuse me, investigating these attacks and have again encouraged citizens to report suspicious activity to their various hotlines. But until something is done, the average citizen is having to take a crash course in counterterrorism in a nation which arrests people for trying to stop terrorist attacks on U.S. soil. So not exactly an easy task, but this is certainly a great time for the average citizen to educate themselves and remain vigilant. And when it comes to future terrorism, uh, we have really one just kind of warning to go out there, uh, and that is that several groups affiliated with Antifa, your more leftist militant groups, uh, have been offering bounties or encouraging the attack of Supreme Court justices in Washington, D.C. So far, uh, bounties have just been offered up for public sightings of Brett Kavanaugh specifically, uh, with bonuses for if he's still at a location when uh, the, the terror groups, when the terrorists arrive. So again, they're looking to target Supreme Court justices deliberately and, and openly now, uh, which again is not surprising, uh, unfortunately. But what is kind of interesting is uh, places like the White House uh, press secretary deliberately uh, egging this kind of stuff on. So the precursor to, to this is uh, Brett Kavanaugh being swarmed uh, while he was out trying to have dinner at a D.C. restaurant. So this kind of spurred these more leftist groups, the IWW, Antifa, uh, any kind of communist party of, you know, whatever city. Uh, these groups are really looking for, for blood, quite literally, uh, and are openly encouraging violence against uh, public officials. So my guess is that due to this latest event involving Brett Kavanaugh, the conservative justices, at least, will be hidden away in secure locations for the foreseeable future. Uh, and, and almost certainly they were probably looking at doing this before the Roe versus Wade decision was released. Uh, the leftist terror groups around this country are really predictable at this point, uh, but with leftist politicians, again, to include the White House press secretary, openly encouraging these kinds 
kinds of attacks, uh, we have to assume that these attacks will probably be used on conservative politicians or public figures as well. So it will probably expand beyond just Supreme Court justices, right? When it comes to leftist groups in this country, they're really only whipped up into action to do politicians bidding for them every few years or so. Uh, I mean, of course, you're going to have your, your classic... Um, communist groups that are pretty much in, well, not pretty much, they are in every single city in this country uh, at this point, but usually they're really kind of small groups. Uh, your more deliberate terroristic kinds of attacks, like your Jane's Revenge type stuff, that only really occurs uh, ever so often once they've kind of get their resources back or they get their funding. Uh, the reason that I think we're seeing a lot of this now is because, of course, Roe vs. Wade was a hugely uh, motivating uh, recruitment tool for them, for one, uh, and it also uh, allowed uh, billionaire politicians to funnel this money into supporting their their demonstrations, their protesting, and especially their bail funds. So as far as what all this means for the average citizen, uh, really the takeaway is to remember that while politicians have taxpayer-funded armed security for protection, which have zero legal implications to think about, you do not. And you most certainly do not want to be collateral damage. So if you're at a location that might be a target for leftist terror groups, remember that defending yourself against these terrorists will in all likelihood result in you being the one prosecuted. Uh, we've seen this in New York very recently uh, and in Texas, but this sentiment has been echoed in pretty much every state around the nation uh, in sporadic cases, right? Uh, I of course don't mean to be overly pessimistic on this, but I just know that I myself do not have the budget to spend years of my life going through a Kyle Rittenhouse style show trial. I would rather egress from an establishment that is undergoing a mob style attack rather than let the terrorists force me into action. That's of course just my own opinion, but I, I always think it's important to remind everyone of the way things are right now within our multi-tier justice system. High-ranking politicians might have security, but if you are dining at the next table over, what do you think is going to happen? Their security team is for them, not for you. Uh, and the legal implications of you being forced to defend yourself are not of their concern either. No politician is going to bail you out of jail or pay your legal fees because their presence near you caused a mob to target you and you had to defend yourself. So please keep this in mind as we move into a time in which politicians of one party are allowed to openly encourage the harm of their enemies and government agents arrest citizens for defending themselves or their families. Again, not a pleasant thing to think about, but I think it needs to be said constantly, especially since genuine domestic terrorism is becoming a norm in the United States. Moving on to significant governmental actions, we'll keep the peachy mood going and talk about UPS. So UPS, United Parcel Service, uh, has apparently gone absolutely insane and is now not only canceling their contracts with gun parts companies such as Brownells, but they are now openly stating that they will be opening and stealing your packages if their scanning sensors detect that you have ordered something they do not like. And if this sounds vague, uh, it's because it is. Uh, UPS has not been clear about any of this. This. The gun community has rightfully expressed outrage over this, uh, especially considering that UPS is going above and beyond to create their own laws. Uh, I guess that this is surprising to a lot of people that a company would confiscate packages that even the ATF says are completely legal. But for those of you that have been following us for a while, you know that we here have been focused on companies that create their own laws for a long time now. Like I've said many times before, this is a huge problem and I don't know what the solution is. I think that the classic argument of they are a private company so they can do what they want uh, is kind of ridiculous at this point. There are only a tiny handful of postal carriers in this country and all of them are heavily federally subsidized with your tax dollars and in many cases directly controlled by federal government. We all know how social media companies have put political regimes into power and how defense contractors have taken your tax dollars to develop technologies that they then refuse to sell to U.S. taxpayers. So UPS doing this is a little surprising because of how quickly they made this decision, especially at a time when so many companies are going broke because of their wokeism. Uh, UPS is neck and neck with their competition and they decide, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go above and beyond, full steam ahead on the woke train to follow laws that don't even exist. When you control the mail, you control 
information. <laughs> I say good luck with that UPS and let's see how that works out for you, but my guess is that people are going to be focusing on using other shipping options, the one or two other options that they have for shipping gun parts around the country. Moving on to number two, this is kind of the incident that has been highlighted by many a conservative news agency over the past couple of weeks, and this is a story that the Biden regime has sold about a million barrels of crude oil to a company that is owned by the Communist Party of China. Uh, not only that, but this oil came from our strategic oil reserves. So we quite literally uh, emptied out our reserves of uh, at least a million barrels of oil to sell to China. Uh, that alone is pretty damning, but it gets better. Uh, the company in question is Sinopec. Uh, this is indeed uh, completely owned by the Chinese state government. But in 2015, a private equity firm called BHR Partners purchased $1.7 billion worth of shares in that company, Sinopec. BHR Associates was created by the Bank of China and, you guessed it, Hunter Biden. As if that is not delicious enough for you, it gets even better. Hunter Biden, to avoid any hint of impropriety, announced that he would be resigning from BHR Partners during Joe Biden's presidential campaign. But guess what? As of the second quarter of 2020, after the election, mind you, Hunter Biden was still listed as a board member. So pretty interesting. I was not able to independently verify whether or not Hunter Biden is affiliated with this company still, uh, but I would stake my entire existence on the entire Biden family being up to their neck in in this rampant and blatant corruption. I think it's pretty clear that that's exactly what's going on by now. So I guess we'll see what happens with this case, uh, but my kindergarten level assessment is that nothing will happen at all uh, as a result of this corruption, but we may see a few Republican congressmen get upset for a bit, but that probably won't result in much being done uh, in the long run. And since Hunter Biden was recently caught smoking crack cocaine, while in detox for smoking crack cocaine, uh, detox that his father paid for, I think that this Hunter Biden saga is just going to keep giving us very interesting tidbits as we move on down the line. Clark, that's the gift that keeps on giving the whole year. So let's wrap things up with a few international issues. First up is the Netherlands. Like I mentioned, uh, the Dutch are still protesting in quite significant numbers. Uh, the police have actually fired several uh, live rounds at least once uh, during the demonstrations at farmers, so it's really unclear as to, to what's going on with regards to these smaller spot protests that have kind of popped up around the nation. This is very much a, a nationwide protest at this point. Uh, and the demonstrations are becoming a bit more lively, uh, with more and more people joining the demonstrations, as people start to realize just what the, the World Economic Forum-controlled Dutch government is trying to do to its people. Uh, similar protests have popped up in various spots around Europe as well, such as in France, uh, for the same reasons. So I guess we'll have to see how kinetic things get as more and more European citizens start to realize what their governments have done to them or are trying to do to them. As one might expect, the farmers, specifically in the Netherlands, have gotten a lot of support from people who realize that farming is kind of an essential activity, and their government's efforts to restrict it are kind of not a good thing. So we'll have to see how this develops. My guess is that these protests will probably grow quite significantly based on the severity of these draconian climate change policies that are uh, far too numerous to even mention, uh, but are kind of popping up everywhere around Europe. Moving over to Germany, uh, Germany's largest housing group, a company called Vanovia, has announced that they will be involuntarily turning down the thermostats in their rental units, uh, the rental units that they own, uh, for the foreseeable future, during the hours of the night when things get the coldest. So a company spokesperson said that from the beginning of the next heating period, the plan is to throttle the heating between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. so that heating only heats up to 17 degrees Celsius, which is about 63 degrees Fahrenheit at night. For those that are unfamiliar with this company, Vanovia is a very infamous company in Germany. It's probably one of the most hated corporate entities in the country uh, because they are a they're very well known for unethical business practices. So this is not a surprise at all. However, they own over half a million apartments, so they're not a small company whatsoever. So again, I would expect this trend in Germany to become very commonplace. Uh, you, however, we might actually see the German government start trying to ration. Now 
natural gas uh, probably very, very soon. Uh, they're kind of floating that idea right now. There's a lot of room into, a lot of rumors flying around uh, regarding rationing natural gas because of Germany's own decisions uh, and their reliance on uh, Russian natural gas, which is now not an option for them. Uh, so that's going to be interesting to follow. As with most things, it does present a few other considerations, though. Wood-fired stoves and other heating appliances have completely disappeared from store shelves as German citizens race to prevent their government from freezing them to death this winter. Uh, this presents a lot of problems. Uh, the energy crisis in Europe, uh, specifically in Germany, uh, has presented a lot of problems, mostly due to how most people on Earth are completely inept when it comes to basic survival skills. The same people that think chocolate milk comes from brown cows also probably think that their home is heated by magical fairy dust. So, you're going to have a lot of people who are completely confused as to why their home is freezing cold, and these people who have never even thought about basic things like energy and heating are suddenly having to figure out how to heat their home when their government or their company decides to restrict their heating. Modern caveman moments like this are likely to cause quite a few problems as inexperienced people race to keep their homes warm. This, of course, is not to cast schadenfreude on the Germans. This is certainly an American thing, too. The number of people that are somehow baffled every winter when their pipes freeze and burst is quite astounding. When it comes to heating in the winter, though, there are a lot of other issues as well. Wintertime is when people tend to buy some of the more unsafe heating appliances, like cheap Chinese space heaters, which then burn their house down. And guess what time of year is most difficult to fight fires in? Wintertime. Injuries for firefighters usually spike during the winter, hydrants and hoses freeze, ice and snow present challenges of their own, and all of this happens at the exact time of year that residential home fires spike. It is a tale as old as time, and one of the main reasons for Murphy's Law. Not only will everything go wrong that can go wrong, but it often does so at the most inopportune times or when it is most difficult to fix the issue, such as residential home fires in the winter. So for any German citizens out there, please be careful with your heating methods this winter. You've had this pair of extra gloves this whole time? Yeah, we're in the Rockies. Jumping over to the Pacific in Japan, uh, the assassination of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has grabbed a lot of headlines this week. I don't really have much to say about this one, but we do not often see the assassination of high-ranking politicians, so I did want to mention it. Abe was very much a controversial figure, uh, mostly due to his political ideology, which some would describe as ultra-nationalistic. Uh, we here in the U.S. hear that and think, well, all right then, but we have to remember that what is nationalist or ultra-nationalist nationalist in other countries is not exactly the same definition as here at home. But yeah, he was still a very controversial figure in Japan. Uh, the West supported him because of his hardline stance on China, which won him support for many Japanese citizens as well. Now, not much is known about the attacker just yet. I'm sure lots of media agencies are doing profiles on the guy by now, but for sure various Antifa elements are celebrating this assassination as expected, so who knows. What is interesting is that crime, especially gun crime, is pretty much completely unheard of in Japan. Uh, this is not something that is easily understandable by a Western audience, much like lots of Japanese culture, I guess. It's kind of hard to explain, but I will say that it's pretty clear that this assassination has rocked the nation for sure. Uh, stuff like this, especially with an improvised firearm, are completely unheard of in Japan. I think what kind of sells this idea is this photo from the assassination, which reminds us that the security detail for a former prime minister carries revolvers. So yeah, that kind of points out how different the culture is in Japan with regards to firearms and law enforcement. Moving to Sri Lanka, the situation in Sri Lanka has deteriorated to about as close to a full-blown collapse as I think we're going to see. Uh, protesters stormed the presidential palace yesterday in order to demand the president's resignation and generally voice their displeasure at the government causing them to starve. The prime minister has agreed to resign and allow the formation of a new government, uh, and the president actually just a few minutes ago as I'm recording this also announced that he will be stepping down as well. Although, even with these resignations, it is unclear if anything can be done at this point to stop the economic collapse and mass starvation. 
Moving to our friends across the pond in the United Kingdom, the news this week has been the resignation of Boris Johnson. This follows a several month saga for Boris, starting with the Partygate scandal and ending with his covering up of his appointment of a serial sexual predator as Deputy Chief Whip. So yeah, not a super great past few months for old Boris, thus his resignation. We shall see how the Conservatives handle his resignation and who might replace him, but no real news on that front. Moving to our friends to the north, up in Canada there have been quite a few issues regarding telecoms this week, mostly stemming from the Rogers Communication Incorporated outage. Rogers Communications is a major telecoms sort of conglomerate that offers a lot of services. They handle everything from normal citizens' uh, cell phones to 911 networks to to credit card transactions to Wi-Fi. They handle a lot of different things and they have had widespread outages since yesterday. Rogers has issued statements uh, late yesterday evening uh, that they should not start having some services come back online as of the evening of the 8th Although today is the ninth, and it's there's still a lot of different outages, uh, particularly with things like 911 call uh, call centers and things like that. So it's really hard to tell when they're going to be fully recovered from this. But yeah, again, uh, Canadians figuring out exactly uh, how vulnerable it is to put all of your eggs in one basket when it comes to telecommunications. Here in the United States, we see this frequently. Like just last time I briefed, uh, we had a, an outage with our uh, unemployment services, and this one company which managed the website for unemployment or uh, unemployment benefits, you know, websites to where you apply for that kind of thing. That one company provided services to over 40 states. And because they went down, they took 40 states unemployment systems down with them. So again, we're finding out just how vulnerable it is and how little of these systems are not networked. You would think that a lot of these systems are either air gapped or on different networks or somehow not completely vulnerable to one thing bringing the entire nation down. But I think we're finding out these days, especially over the past couple of years, uh, with the rise of cyber attacks, that this is most certainly not the case. And systems, which should be air-gapped, like 911 call centers, most certainly are not. And finally, in Afghanistan, it has been a while since I mentioned something with uh, Afghanistan, and I wanted to end on something that doesn't really have much intel value, but is utterly fascinating to me, and that is the unearthing of Mullah Omar's vehicle from its hiding place in Afghanistan. For those that don't know who this is, Mohammed Omar, mostly just called Mullah Omar, uh, was the founder of the Taliban in Afghanistan, and has been an almost mythological feature in Afghan culture over the years. Uh, Back in the early years of the war, he went into hiding, and remained so until he died, uh, reportedly of tuberculosis, in 2013. And now, a few days ago, we've learned from pictures posted on social media that his followers have unearthed his personal vehicle that he had placed into hiding during the initial invasion. His followers posted photos of themselves digging up the vehicle that he used to escape from the 2001 U.S. invasion. Apparently, this was the vehicle that he used to drive from his home in Kandahar to his hiding place in Zabal, where he remained for the majority of the war uh, in hiding, sometimes just a few hundred meters away from American fobs and outposts. Based on these photos, it's clear that he and his team had buried his Toyota Corolla wagon underground in the event that he needed it again. And now that the Taliban have their victory, they are now starting to literally unearth some of the items important to the history of Afghanistan and their own history uh, as the Taliban. Uh, As distasteful as it may seem to even have the slightest respect towards one of our nation's most vicious enemies, uh, especially with the fall of Afghanistan and all of the pain that caused... Uh, I myself can't help but be fascinated by the history of of stuff like this. And and I hope that in the coming years, we get to hear some of the stories from the other side of the wire so that we may better understand how we lost that war. For now, I think that a simple Toyota being dug out of the ground illustrates that we cannot possibly begin to imagine how much we don't know about that war. The exact same thing happened with Vietnam, too. General Vo Nguyen Zap, the head general in charge of the NVA, survived the war only to remain a mystery for the most part. And Mullah Omar, like General Zap, remains an enigma to the West. Despite both of these men having a huge role in being the leaders of the only organizations to ever topple multiple superpowers. 
I just think that if Western military leadership isn't really interested in learning from their enemies, I certainly am. And I would be especially interested to learn the stories from the other side of the wire, lest we repeat the same mistakes again. Mistakes that cost us dearly. Anyway, I didn't mean to get all philosophical, I just thought that was interesting, and I really can't wait to get started on some more of the Warfare Studies sort of content that we've been researching for the past few months. So thank you again for watching everyone, and thank you again for all of your support. I really do mean it. Especially for those of you who support us out there on Patreon and Utreon, you guys are just really awesome, and helping us out that way allows us to keep bringing this kind of thing to you. I think we're going to be pretty busy trying to track a lot of these more kinetic incidents that have occurred here in the United States, here at home, and also overseas uh, in the international arena. Uh, definitely going to be a uh, busy next few weeks and months, uh, unfortunately. So we'll keep an eye on that, and we will see you next time. And as always, fight in the shade.